Hello, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Community Conservation, a series that presents projects, ideas, and people surrounding conservation work in Oregon. I'm your host, Sarah Armstrong, the Marketing Manager at Oregon Wildlife Foundation. So for those of you who are new with the foundation, we're an organization that's dedicated to funding wildlife and habitat conservation work throughout Oregon since 1981. If you wanna support the conservation work that we do, and if you wanna support this free educational series, go ahead and fill out that form below at any time. This series would not be possible without the collaboration of our partners, presenters, and of course, you are dedicated supporters. So if you have questions for our speakers, just type your message in the chat and they'll get to it. There will be other participation throughout this presentation that we'll also be adding in the chat for you to take a look at later on. Today's topic is about the intersection of our day-to-day -day human life and how we live with wildlife or maybe it's how we live, they live with us. So in addition to our presentation today, we have the foundation's development manager, Clay Augustine with us. Clay, thanks for joining. Hi, thanks Sarah, <laughs> happy to be here. And our two experts today both specialize in understanding wildlife and urban settings and have each created systems using science and strategy to analyze the cohabitation of animals and humans. To explain more, Erica Patterson, Project Coordinator at Urban Wildlife and Information Network Portland Chapter, and Leslie Bliss Ketchum, Co-Owner and Director of Samara Group. Welcome. Thank you. Erica, do you want to tell us a little bit more about you and your expertise? Uh, sure. Um, my name is Erica Patterson. I am a business analyst at Sika, Sika Technology group in Portland. Um, we're a software development company. Um, and on the side, I'm the project manager for the Portland chapter of the Urban Wildlife Information Network. Um, I got my degree in conservation biology from Colorado State University, and I've worked a variety of wildlife oriented jobs since then, which have really brought me to where we are today. I also want to mention that UNPDX is a sponsored project by the foundation, and um, we are actually the primary partner in the project along with PSU, uh, Audubon, and of course, Smear Group, which actually leads me to our next presenter. <laughs> Leslie, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit? Sure. Thanks, Sarah. Um, happy to be here. So my name is Leslie Bliss Ketchum, and I'm a co-owner and director of the Smear Group, which uh, is an environmental consulting firm that I founded with my colleague, Jolene, in 2015. Um, I also am an adjunct faculty at Portland State University, where I received my doctorate studying habitat connectivity for wildlife. Um, I also currently serve as the um, secretary treasurer for the Urban Wildlife Working Group, um, which is connected to UN, as you'll see when I give my slides later. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, do you want to speak a little, or both of you, Erica and Leslie, on how long you both have been working together? Oh, sure. Well, gosh, with the UN development, I think it's, we're going on three years with you in. Yeah, surprisingly, it's kind of a shock <laughs> that it's been that long. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. It's about and also, right. you win is not where our Portland chapter is about that old, right? So the Portland chapter is about three years old, but you win as its own group is in other cities, right? Yeah, and I'll, I'll definitely take a deep dive into it in the talk, but um, the network actually started to grow in 2016. Oh, so wow. it's been around for about six years now. That's great. Well, do you want to go ahead and start your presentation then? Sure, you got it. <laughs> Another great segue. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's see here. Let me go ahead and share the right screen the first time, hopefully. And we'll get going. All right, here we go. Um, so first off, as you mentioned, Sarah, I just want to put out a big thank you to the foundation for helping support this work happening on the ground um, in Portland. Really has been an excellent partner, not just in this project, but um, with so many other things that I've been involved with that really needed that little extra push to get going. So thank you all for being here. <laughs> 
Um, but also a big thank you to uh, Kriya K. She is actually the uh, coordinator for the Urban Wildlife Information Network out of the Lincoln Park Zoo. And she helped support uh, the development of this presentation with some of the background information. So um, moving on. Let's start with kind of the foundation here of why would we study urban wildlife in the first place? Um, a lot of places really start looking at urban wildlife because of kind of the negative connotations of urban wildlife. So disease transmission, also conflicts, you know, um, a lot of people end up with maybe skunks in the crawl space or squirrels in the attics or raccoons on the back porch eating the cat food. Um, but uh, there are also these really, um, the, the positive side, these really wonderful aspects of urban wildlife, including the connection to nature that we have when we can interact with urban wildlife in, in distant ways. <laughs> don't go out and snuggle them, please. They don't like that. Um, <laughs> but um, in general, especially you know, recently with quarantine and people being at home, there's been this incredible rise in like backyard bird watching. And we actually have a tendency to kind of notice more because we're home more. And it's such a, a cool bond that can form in that way with our sense of place and the organisms that share the space that with us. Um, but also by studying and understanding more about urban wildlife, we can also understand how the built environment either supports or maybe doesn't support um, various types of wildlife species. You know, um, wildlife interactions and how wildlife might respond to things like roads or buildings or our, our built infrastructure is really species specific. And so there's so much nuance to how each species might interact with that. We can learn a lot by studying it. So with that and, and that kind of understanding of needing to know more about our urban wildlife, um, the Lincoln Park Zoo actually started developing this protocol um, and that ended up forming the foundation for the Urban Wildlife Information Network. Um, <clears throat> and that was developed in association with this Urban Wildlife Biodiversity Monitoring Project. Um, and you can see in the map image here, these transects are the yellow lines, and then the dots along those yellow lines represent camera stations. Um, and those are used to monitor wildlife in these different green spaces that occur along those transects. And those transects run from really the center of Chicago, that urban center where you have the highest density of the built environment, highest human population density, moving out to more rural and, and um, wild areas. Um, and so also this is Liza Lair here. She's the assistant director at the Urban Wildlife Center and also involved with the Urban Wildlife Working Group. Um, so what they use is these motion detect cameras, right, to collect the information and to monitor wildlife activity across seasons. Um, and using these cameras is gives us such a cool opportunity to get glimpses of what wildlife are doing and how wildlife are interacting in kind of the absence of our direct presence, right? Um, and these incredible moments can sometimes be captured like you see here with this coyote um, in hot pursuit of this deer. <laughs> um, and also when um, being able to kind of get these close up intimate views of these animals um, when they're not really aware of our presence. Well, they do usually know the, notice the cameras, but <laughs> we're not actually there is such a unique opportunity. Um, so Link Park Zoo in 2016, as I mentioned, started reaching out to partners to develop the Urban Wildlife Information Network. And so really, I, this is the most recent map of partner cities that I got from Korea. And you can see there is actually really great distribution across the continental US and even partners up in Canada as well. Um, and you can see interesting um, spots where you have like maybe paired cities that are not that far away from each other, and then others that are just all the way across the US. It's pretty neat. And then also, from what I understand, there are some conversations with partner cities in further international locations that might be forthcoming. So um, provides a really neat opportunity for collaborative work. And using these um, shared protocols, if everyone's using the same methods to collect the data, it makes it really easy to compare. Um, and so not only is there this shared, shared data collection protocol with the transects, but also um, the central data repository. So all the data goes in the same place. Um, and that really opens up the door to these multi-city comparisons and scale. So um, let's talk about 
different scales for a second and it's kind of the really interesting questions we can ask about that. So at the local scale, like say just within that Chicago biodiversity monitoring project um, and here in Portland with just our transects, we could look at how the species that we see at a given area and how many of them we see varies across maybe the different sizes of green space that we have a camera in, maybe um, the different types. So cemeteries have a tendency to be pretty um, hot spot areas for wildlife activity, um, parks and natural areas. We can look at, you know, that human population that we talked about, how dense the housing is, um, socioeconomics and other cultural drivers, and then also how species are interacting in these areas if we happen to catch that on camera. So there's so many different things and different dimensions and things that we can learn just within a single city. Um, but if we take that to the next level, we can look at this concept of, of differences between cities, right? So similar um, in the respect of, you know, how many species and what types of species are we seeing? But now we can look at differences between the human population. You know, different cities are also built differently, right? Like the way that we're really lucky here in Portland to have an urban growth boundary, right? So that's designed to limit sprawl while other cities don't have that. And so they're much more spread out perhaps. Um, also older cities that have had development for longer. And those are all things we can compare when we have multiple cities, right? So pretty exciting. And let's take it one more. <laughs> <laughs> And the next level we could also look at is totally different regions, right? And that's that's this benefit of having this across the US and then international scope is we can look at totally different um, eco regions. So we could compare something like um, Utah or Arizona to our, our much more wet, like Western Oregon side, Western Oregon versus Eastern Oregon, um, East Coast, West Coast, you know, North and South. So really exciting to be able to pursue those. And really without something like UN, that's really in a multi-city collaborative structure, we wouldn't be able to answer Answer questions at all three scales. So really valuable stuff here. <laughs> um, so with that cross city collaboration, there's actually been and again, it's only really been six years, which is not that much time. Um, 10 different papers have been published associated with uh, the data that's been collected as part of the UN system. Um, nine multi city analysis papers were approved by the committee. That's part of the partnership processes. Um, you approve sharing your data, which is nice. You have some autonomy there. Um, but also the, their most recent multi-city analysis, these numbers are just amazing, include 887 different camera sites, 20 different cities sharing those methods, 105 seasons of data, 100,000 detections of species, and over 2 million images. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. <laughs> so just so much information coming out of this. And I mean, you can imagine just if any one entity tried to do this on their own, the amount of resources it would take would be just astronomical, especially in such a short amount of time. Right. But with this collaboration, it can happen much faster. I have a question for you, and I, I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but how how are the cities chosen? Is that that's a good question. Yeah. And I'm sure Erica will touch on kind of how some of that development came um, to Portland. But I know for us, in part, there was a lot of attention um, on Portland because we were hosting the International Urban Wildlife Conference coming up. And also some of that involvement and interaction with um, the Urban Wildlife Working Group helps kind of made that connection between the Lincoln Park Zoo as well. And, and there, that's not the only thing by any means, but um, those aspects along with others will uh, contributed to just knowing about it. And I think anybody is welcome to join, um, which is fantastic, so. Oh, I also have another question about this data. I'm wondering, is it available for people to look up even just general scopes data on the website or is this something that's kept kind of within the group? Yeah, it's definitely something that's shared within partners, but again, anybody could join. Um, and then also sometimes there are like special requests, like proposals come up in new research that folks would like to do with multi-city data. And so there's actually been some calls started right now on a new publication looking at the effect of quarantine on urban wildlife response. Um, and so that along with, um, I think before that, there was also a proposal about wildlife use of golf courses um, and kind of how that looks across cities as well. So lots of different ideas. Nice. Yeah. 
Cool. <laughs> so not only, I mentioned the, the typical method that are being is used right now to monitor the wildlife activity is those remote cameras. And those cameras are great for collecting information on mostly mammals and larger bodied. You can get smaller guys like these possums and squirrels and stuff fairly easy, depending on how your camera's set up. Um, but there's been some talk amongst partners recently on looking at adding like acoustic monitoring and other techniques so that we can broaden the scope of the wildlife uh, data that's being collected. So the awesome thing about acoustic monitors is you could get birds in the daytime and if it's the right settings and frequency you could get bats at night. Um, and then also I know some partners are talking about how can we also build in maybe reptile and amphibian monitoring in some of these locations and then others have also looked at invertebrate monitoring. So we could really start to expand and um, get a more biodiverse perspective on urban wildlife use using these different techniques. So um, really exciting. Um, also, there's even more that UN is doing, and that's that we have different subcommittees or different committees within UN. Um, I think that in my experience working with um, various types of wildlife groups, the urban wildlife folks are the ones that inherently very much so recognize, and it's part of the job description that even though the focus is wildlife, what you're really doing is you're working with people. And that becomes most obvious in the urban environment. And so these committees also reflect that. And so education is a big committee, um, also environmental justice, super important, um, and technology in how we're sharing information and how we can do that better. Um, and one of the um, community, one of the city partners, Chris Shell, just recently published with co-authors um, this paper that I have up here in science. Um, awesome paper. Um, I mentioned that I teach and right now I'm teaching an urban ecology class at PSU and we started off the class with that paper. Um, the ecological and evolutionary consequences of systemic racism, racism in urban environments. And it's just really foundational and amazing. If you get a chance, please check it out. <laughs> wow, yeah, definitely. I'm also like, a, I'm a PSU alum and I think that it's so cool. Yeah, it, it totally makes sense too, because it's so, it's in, it's between city center and where Portland kind of starts to break off into a more natural, naturescape or like protected wildlife areas and stuff. So it's so cool that you're, you're heading projects like this, even a class like that always fun. It's an adventure for sure. <laughs> Um, so some of the events that also um, UN is doing or is thinking about expanding into, again, you know, quarantine stuff put a little bit of a damper on planning another summit, but generally um, there's at least been one in the past where all the UN city partners kind of came together to share and talk about the direction of the, of the group and different things to explore. Um, they're also looking at a wildlife friendly city certification, which I think could be incredible, kind of like Tree City USA or like uh, pollinator friendly city. I think that could be really neat to take some of the lessons learned from the data collected and actually like turn that into practice. Um, and then also looking to expand that educational impact. I think there's so many different types of education and audiences that could be um, reached out to with different educational aspects of urban wildlife, both to reduce conflict um, and also to um, enhance the positive interactions <laughs> that we could have. Um, so with that, I will give a total shout out, like I have been all along, to the Urban Wildlife Working Group. <laughs> um, we've got, I've got the web address there. We can also put it in the chat. Um, just pretty basic though, urbanwildlifegroup.org if you want to learn more about them. Um, but this group puts on an international conference every two years. And like I mentioned, the 2019 one was in Portland uh, and it was awesome. We had great keynotes. Uh, Chris Shell, the author of that paper was actually one of our keynotes from last, from 2019. Um, but also there was a whole session on the Urban Wildlife Information Network where partners were sharing their data and sharing some of these cross city publications. And I, there is one planned for this next meeting. Um, we have the 2021 conference will be virtual this year. Um, and that's, you can learn more about that one. We just closed abstracts and, you know, pretty soon we should be gearing up for um, enrollment and that's urban-wildlife.org. So um, with that, I will hand it to Erica for the deep dive into the like more Portland centric stuff. <laughs> yes. Hi, Erica. Welcome. I'm so excited about this. There's so much information between what you're talking about with what your group is doing and then the, um, the, all of the different essays and abstracts that you're talking about for the um, the meetings that you're having, and then also the data that you're literally collecting, Erica, here in Portland. Yeah, um, yeah, and thank you, Leslie, for the introduction to UN. Um, 
Let me just share my screen. Cool. Um, yeah, so I kind of wanted to take more of a deep dive into how you and came to Portland. Um, I'm saying UN is just kind of the, the short term for Urban Wildlife Information Network, um, the abbreviation. Um, <laughs> it's a bit of a mouthful, um, but this should hopefully get to your question, Sarah, about how cities are chosen. Um, it's a lot less formal than you would think. Um, and then kind of the second part to my portion of this discussion, um, I just wanted to bring my experience as someone who's who's not really affiliated with a conservation or an environmental group um, working in conservation research. Um, and I certainly can't take all the credit for that, which I'll get to, but um, yeah, start with that. So as Leslie mentioned, um, Ewan started in Chicago. Um, at the time it was under a man named Seth Magley at the Lincoln Park Zoo. Um, and when I first heard about the project in 2017, um, I believe they had already been collecting data for about eight years, um, though they hadn't started, they just started getting into the multi-city aspect of that. So Chicago has been doing this for a long time now and they have a huge trove of uh, urban wildlife data. And um, I think they spent a lot of that time kind of perfecting the protocol that all of the cities now use um, that makes this data comparable. Um, that being said, I actually heard about this project um, in Colombia, in Cartagena. Um, I attended a, the International Congress on Conservation Biology um, in 2017. I was just an attendee. I wasn't there to present or anything. And I heard Seth give a talk about some of the lessons learned um, thus far with their, their uh, urban gradient um, wildlife monitoring project in Chicago. And I was kind of immediately hooked, um, both just on the project as well as its implications for urban wildlife management. Um, and this is still crazy to me, but it turned out even though this project started in Chicago, Seth was living in Fort Collins, Colorado, which is where I was living. Um, and he was managing the program remotely. So I had the chance once back in Colorado to meet with Seth um, to take part in the Fort Collins chapter of UMPDX, um, see how the protocol worked. I put cameras out a couple of times and I met with Seth um, for an informational interview just to see how I could get more involved because it was something that really interested me. Um, and he mentioned that, you know, they were trying to expand the program to other cities. And there was this big gap at the time in the Pacific Northwest, which again, like the pieces all aligned, I was moving to Portland, like within a couple of months. It was just like- It was meant to be. <laughs> yeah, everything just kind of came together. <laughs> I love when that happens. I mean, like, that's such a good telling too. Like you're, you got the passion, you're ready to go. And then all of a sudden you happen to be moving. Wow. Yeah. It was very much right place, right time. Um, and I think it, you know, for other people who are interested in doing this and bringing this to your city, like, as long as you have the interest in it, I think you can do it. Yeah. But anyways, this brings us finally to Portland. Um, Seth and Leslie had met before or had some sort of relationship and he put me in touch with her when I moved to Portland um, early 2018. Um, and what started as just a couple of emails and a couple of in-person meetings, um, as strange as in-person meetings sound now, <laughs> like these days, um, UMPDX really started to take shape. Um, and then Leslie from there introduced me and brought in Alyssa Starry from Portland State University, um, Joe Levisite from Portland Audubon, and Tim Gresseth from Oregon Wildlife Foundation. Um, and that's kind of our core partnership that's persisted to today. Um, and I guess 
that first year was just a lot of a lot of back and forth between all of us. I spent multiple weekends just kind of driving all over Portland to do camera uh, location like scouting missions. <laughs> I was just we would identify um, places using like Google satellite imagery. Um, we're like, oh, that's a green space, and it's kind of along this transect that we've laid out um, along, you know, the west side of Portland. Um, and then I would go that weekend and see if there was actually a viable spot to put a camera. Um, do you have an example? I mean, I don't know if you have this further on in your presentation, but do you have an example of some of the places you would drive around to and just be like, oh, this is it. Okay, I'm setting up a camera. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'm actually glad you asked this question because I didn't dedicate a slide to this. So. <laughs> I'm super nosy about it too because I live in Portland and so I'm like, I want to yeah. know all the little pockets you were discovering. <laughs> yeah, um, so I guess kind of broadly, when we first started talking about our transects, we decided that rather than do just one long transect, which is what some cities do, we were going to do two, um, one radiating from like downtown Portland out to uh, Western, like past Beaverton, like out in Hillsborough area, and then one on the east side. Um, and part of our reasoning behind that, and this is where I have to really take my hat off to the people I was working with, because I didn't know Portland at all. Um, but Leslie pointed out that on the west side of Portland, there's kind of these green ribbons that run down from Forest Park. And so all the landscapes over there are a lot more connected than they are in eastern Portland, where there's more a kind of patchwork of little green islands. You have all the Butte parks and um, yeah, just smaller, more patchwork green areas to place cameras. Um, but as an example, um, on the western side, there's Bethany Lake State Park. And so my, my scouting mission out there involved just driving to the park and then walking around with my dog for, you know, 30 to 40 minutes trying to find a place where we might put a camera that wouldn't be too obstructed um, by greenery and vegetation, um, but was also still out of sight of um, other park goers and people exploring the area. Um, because I think one of the, the big obstacles to urban conservation is, is uh, hiding your equipment so that it doesn't get tampered with. Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Well, and I'll also just add to um, what you're saying there, Erica, that we also had to look at land use or land ownership. So we yeah. might find a nice little green space, but who do we then talk to <laughs> about putting a camera there, right? So there was a lot of work to that and Erica did a great job. Did you ever yeah. have a situation like that where there was private land and you thought this is, I mean, without getting, having to get too specific about it, but you thought, wow, this, like, this is necessary. This is a good data collecting point. And then have to go through that process where you're talking with people and you're trying to connect with them about the wildlife. Yeah, yes. Um, it's, you know, we did try to choose like within the locations we were looking at, we tried to choose like public parks primarily. Um, and, and that made it easy to just reach out to the parks and recreation district that was in charge of that park, um, request a research permit. Um, but there were, there was a couple of locations that we kind of had put pins in and, and either they were part of an HOA that just said no or it was, I'd never found the landowner. It was like this little block of land, um, kind of just on the west side of Forest Park. Um, and I, I couldn't figure out who owned it. So I never got permission and there's not a camera there. To this day. <laughs> so um, there's definitely a need to be flexible there. Um, but it was a great experience. And like Leslie said, once we had kind of scouted out locations we thought would be good, we then obtained landowner permissions to put the cameras there for a month, three times a year, so three months total. Um, which brings me to the spring of 2019 where we put out our first cameras. Um, and urban wildlife from all around flocked for the casting call. I love um, this, I love this so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and I promise I'll show some some of the photos that we've captured through this. Um, 
but that first season was really just a pilot season. We put, I think, two or three cameras out and the, the network's requirement is to have 25 cameras across at least 35 kilometers of a gradient of urban density. Um, and from that first season, we've just kind of like bit by bit added more cameras. Um, we started just on the west side and we have, um, I think 10 or 12 cameras on that side now um, that go up every April, July and October. Um, and then over the past year, we added in the east side transect. Um, and had a couple of false starts there. Um, COVID threw a wrench into everything this spring. We were hoping to get our 25 cameras and our like official UN certification um, out in April. And then of course, everything was shut down. So we postponed, um, which many cities didn't put cameras out in over the spring because of the same reasons where people were still staying at home and, um, just kind of the politics of being out there researching in a park when a city is saying, please don't go recreate in a sure. park. Sure, yeah, so, definitely. Yeah, um, and then we hit another uh, sort of hiccup this summer. Um, we had the 25 locations, but we ended up not being able to put all of them out on the east side because of the fires. Um, there was some more park closures. So it's been, I mean, 2020 was quite the year for everyone and everything including including wildlife research. yeah a couple obstacles <laughs> yeah just a flu <laughs> or a few <laughs> um yeah um lost my train of thought there a little bit um oh i have some photos <laughs> um yeah so i guess over the last couple of years, we've we've built up our, our cameras and this past fall, we officially had 25 cameras out. Um, we got the, the check mark from CREA. Um, they're all, you know, appropriately spaced. Um, I think one parameter I forgot to mention is they have to be at least a kilometer apart. Um, and we've been collecting data um, for the last two years in Portland. Um, and like Leslie mentioned, it's a lot of what you might expect, kind of the mid to large size wildlife um, that you see in an urban environment. We have skunks, um, so many coyotes, just everywhere. This photo in particular, we got this past fall and we're still debating what exactly that coyote has in his mouth. It's kind of is it a chicken or is it a deer head? Um, I don't know if you guys. Oh have boy, any. maybe we need to take a poll and some, yeah. we can get some, <laughs> some yeah. very exciting answers. Raccoons, more raccoons. Yeah, oh, a cat. Cat that are taken by the coyotes. On yeah, the yeah, you do see a lot of sad lost lost cat posters out in Portland, especially in the Forest Park area. I know. <laughs> yeah, that always just breaks my heart when I see this because I'm like, oh, kitty met a coyote. Yep. I've lost a coyote <laughs> that way. Keep them inside. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, deer. Um, this one camera, I put a bunch of photos up from it because we just got so much activity. Um, Mama and her two babies. And then we'll also get things like birds. You have this little Stellar's Jay down in the left corner there. Um, Northern Flicker. This photo is one of the first photos we got and it makes me laugh every time. <laughs> this little chickadee like poking up in the bottom here, kind of, it's blurry. I didn't just, even, I, re <laughs> I really didn't see anything. And I thought, wow, this is a Where's Waldo situation. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, no, right it, there. <laughs> It looks a bit like a branch, but it, I love this so me, much. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, he's just like, he's taking a peek and he's just like, what is this? What is this brown box on this tree? And why is it here? Yeah. Um, One of my favorite things about this job that I have is looking at just wildlife photos and just, you know, it's just funny. It's just fun and nice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's great. Uh, it's my favorite part of doing this. Um, at the end of every season, I pull in the cameras and I get to look through and see like what sort of interesting shots we got. Um, 
most of them are kind of blurry and you can tell what they are, but they're not like, you know, really worth displaying. It's a lot of like raccoons running away or um, we do get a lot of like cats and dogs, like house cats and dogs that are off leash and running around. And they're just as attracted to the scent lore that we put out as wildlife are. So um, yeah. You guys put out a scent. We do, yes, oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the reasoning behind it is just, you know, it's not a super strong scent, but it's, we, you can kind of see it in this picture. It's on the tree over here, that little black square. Um, we just put it in the, the line of sight for the camera so that if there's wildlife in, in the area, we'll get them in front of the camera because they come and check out this scent lore. So I take it it's motion activated. It is. And it's yeah. and for the night um, photos, is that is that just a regular thing? There's not like a flash or anything going off, right? There it's not a flash really. There is a little red light. And oh. you'll notice a lot of the the wildlife. I'll I'll back it up. They they do come and check out. Here we go. This coyote is coming to see what what exactly is flashing in the bushes over there. And so you do get a lot of wildlife who they come to see the, or smell the scent lure, and then they he, like hear the little click or they, they see the light and then they walk right towards the camera to kind of see what exactly is going on. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Neat. Yeah. Um, so I, like I mentioned, I'm not affiliated with a conservation like organization. I, I work on software uh, for my nine to five. Um, and I just kind of want to drive home for other people interested in doing this stuff. Like it, it takes a village, right? I reached out to you and who put me in touch with Leslie at Samara and she put me in touch with Oregon Wildlife in Portland State and Portland Audubon. And each of those organizations has provided further opportunities to expand the project. Um, kind of back to your question, Sarah, about putting cameras on private lands. We did try to put cameras um, in backyards with members of the Backyard Habitat Program um, one season. And um, we, we got mostly their pets because the yards were fenced in and we right. didn't continue with that. Um, but it was still really cool to have members of the community reach out and be like, I really want to do this. Like, what can I do to help? Um, which I think is probably a good time for me to mention, there are opportunities with this to volunteer, um, especially at the end of the season, we have to tag every photo um, with the species that's in the photo. And that photo has to be tagged twice. Um, for verification and then if there's a discrepancy between those tags there's a third level of verification that it has to go through just to make sure that we have really high quality data um, and so if anyone is interested in volunteering um, i will provide an email um, i'll put it in the chat here um, but it's un.pdx at gmail.com and uh we have a lot of photos still from this summer, um, as well as I've hardly even started on the ones from this fall um, to tag. So happy to accept volunteers. Um, and I have a yeah, question about that, Erica. Yeah. So if someone wanted to volunteer, but they aren't a biologist, mm -hmm. um, how, would, how could they help you if they aren't real confident about their identification skills? Sure. Um, well, I'm also happy if people want to help me put cameras out. Uh, COVID has put a little bit of a wrench in that, but mm -hmm. um, people can can volunteer to help put cameras out. I will say that for the most part, the tagging is pretty straightforward. Um, it's you know, it's deer, raccoons, skunks. Um, and because of the verification, I don't think you have to have a really strong understanding 
if you have a basic understanding of urban wildlife, um, I think you can participate and everything will be verified. So it just you it would helps. probably learn a lot too by doing it, I bet. Yeah, yeah. It it just helps, yeah, to get <laughs> get through those multiple levels of tagging so that we can um that's something I should mention. All the photos don't enter the larger database with all those points that Leslie mentioned until they've been tagged. So the sooner that we can get them in and available for analysis for people's projects, like the better. Um, uh, yeah. Has, so. has you win as a larger, not just your PDX group, but has you win ever thought about working uh, through an app? I know there's like, there's a Cornell app for bird identifications. And I know there's like other plant apps and it's kind of this citizen science put together with technology to do this kind of ecology and biology, you know, and it's like all of these things combined, but through an app. Have you guys ever thought about doing something like that? Um, yes, <laughs> especially working in software. I see a lot of opportunity there as well as, so we are this multi-city cooperative, um, but each city does it a little bit differently. And I know there are some cities that use some sort of app to, to involve the community and help with tagging. Um, we haven't at Portland. Um, I could see that being hugely beneficial in the future. Um, yeah, I don't know if you have anything else on that, Leslie. Yeah, nothing super specific, but I, I would say that that technology committee is one of the places where they discuss like different ways to share information and, and just to tag on what Erica said about each city does have kind of their own spin on how, how they use and implement the data and in some cases it's in collaboration with other agencies and so the data is part of their urban management program and maybe, <clears throat> maybe they have those transects set up that contribute to you in they have other cameras as well that they're then collecting data from for different purposes too. Right. So that all kind of ties together in different levels of community engagement. And yeah, th there's a lot of opportunity there though, in a nutshell. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, cool. So I will wrap this up. Um, uh oh, there it goes. Um, I, I just want to finish with some of my I guess advice for other other people like me who want to to get involved, not necessarily in UN, but in some sort of conservation research in their own communities. Um, so I'm I'm going to use and probably exhaust a fishing metaphor here, um, but getting this project off the ground, I felt was a bit like fishing, where I was both the fish and the fisherwoman. Um, I was fishing for a place that I could make an impact. Um, and when I heard about you and I took the bait, um, <laughs> uh, I imagine my experience and my passion for conservation is pretty similar, um, to others. So, um, I've boiled down my effort into a few fishing related, um, pieces of advice for aspiring community conservationists. Um, I should say I don't really fish. I don't know where this came from, but I love it, this. It seems <laughs> great. Yeah. It's resonating strongly. Yeah. I don't right. fish either though. Yeah. It's a metaphor. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so first you need you need the hook. Um, you need to find what interests you. Um, conservation, the environment, climate change, these are all extremely uh, broad terms. Um, so trying to boil it down to something that that A interest you um, and B is within your reach. Um, I'm really interested in studying penguins, but I'm nowhere near the Antarctic. So it's not really something I can do. Uh, UN worked for me. I wanted to learn more about how the built environment impacts wildlife. Um, and I just happened to be get, moving to a place um, where there is a gap for UN. And um, like I said, the pieces just kind of fell together. Um, and then line, once you have the hook, follow it, uh, reach out to the experts, uh, see if you can get on a call for an informational interview, um, offer to volunteer or ask if you can shadow someone doing the work you're interested in. Um, 
In other words, just be persistent and find your in and assemble a team of as people as excited about the effort as you are and be prepared for delays and setbacks alongside the triumphs. Um, yes. Pretty self-explanatory. So. Great advice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I love that metaphor. It's great. <laughs> Very fitting. Yeah. Thanks. Um, well, I actually, I have a quick question for both of you. You talked about, Erica, you talked about using connections with Parks and Rec when trying to set up cameras. And I know both of you have talked about all this data that you are collecting. Are there any organizations or departments of the state that come to you saying, hey, I want to use this data like Fish and Wildlife or the Forestry Department. Do you ever collaborate with them on the data? Yeah, I think, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Erica, go ahead. I was about to say that I think Leslie can answer this oh. better. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say that I think now that we're really rolling with the protocol and getting set up, it's going to help facilitate those conversations. Um, I've definitely mentioned the program to different folks um, to see where the connections are. And I think especially with our partners that we're putting cameras up in their, their spaces that they manage, that information is super interesting to them. And I think that's going to help support actually furthering our connections and partnerships locally and get that data used. And maybe also hopefully get them plugged in a little more fully with that UN network and see the value in those comparative analysis too. So, uh. Wow. Um, and, and do you, do either of you know, or are you able to say if there's another Oregon city that's going to be using the information network for urban wildlife? Well, I can say that um, for sure that I know Wilson, I've been working in Wilsonville looking at um, wildlife crossing structures out there for many years, as, <laughs> as you know, Sarah, for sure. Um, and I know that there's definitely interest in growing their camera network there. Um, and ultimately that may lead to a connection with a UN type type protocol development. For now, kind of have to start out small, but it could be a really cool comparison because the population sizes are very different, but are part of the same metro region as well. So it'd be a very close comparison. Um, other than that, I'm hoping this talk will also maybe result in some interest. I think it would be so cool to, there's so many different comparisons, like every, any other partner city could provide really interesting information, both locally and across. So opening it up. <laughs> yeah. Well, this really ties into the previous four episodes we've done of community conservation. I mean, from the Clackamas River, like what if there were cameras out there from our, you know, episode way back then. Um, and then all the way to the Wolverines, they're kind of doing a similar thing, I guess, in the Wallawas, mm -hmm. pitching footage of the Wolverine, the Wolverine, the one. Um, <laughs> And then the Harborton frogs that we just talked about last month. I mean, wouldn't it be fun if there were cameras catching the frogs crossing Highway 30? I mean, uh, seems like there's so much potential. And then we hear so much about the mule deer in Bend. I mean, what if there was a UN program out there capturing all the different wildlife that moves around that area? For sure. Yeah, I know Leslie's, I, Leslie specifically, I know is pretty familiar with the Harborton frog shuttle, which we did an episode of in January and also um, the Gilcrest wildlife underpass that's also, lava yeah, I get, yeah, yeah, Lava Butte, mm -hmm. and then, um, yeah, any kind of uh, underpasses, or I guess the use of overpasses, and of course the importance of that, or why we would even need to do that, and it all definitely has to do with tracking our urban wildlife, or understanding the ecology of what we're doing here as humans, too, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Clay, well, do you have any other... <laughs> <laughs> Clay, do you have any other questions about the presentation before I get into the QA? Um, well, you mentioned the wildlife friendly certification for cities. I just love that idea so much. Um, like, is there any way that citizens can help maybe push our cities to do this? And what would that take? Like send a letter to the mayor or something? <laughs> yeah, well, I think that's definitely something that hasn't been fully developed yet, um, but probably something that would come out of some of those, uh, like defining what that program would look like. Mm -hmm. And then once it's established, then we can perhaps put some pressure on our local uh, governments to then become certified. Mm -hmm. um, so that's definitely a future direction, but I think that both the partner cities of UN and others that are collaborating with Lincoln Park Zoo could add some support to developing that. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know exactly what the requirements would be just yet, but I think I could I could make some up, but I won't. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, we'll watch it develop. That's yeah. Uh, any anything else, Clay? Um, well, I do have a, a question about um, people that aren't in a, a large city like Portland, but maybe a smaller city, um, like a coastal town. Like what 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 is considered a large enough city for the urban for you in basically? Like what if someone in like Pacific City wanted to do something? Would that qualify? I think potentially um, within the protocol, there's there's kind of a breakdown of the the main point is to get the cameras along a gradient of urban density. Um, so as long as roughly a third of the cameras are, I don't know how big Pacific City is. This is it's pretty small. Small, maybe something like <laughs> Tomac or Lincoln City or Newport. Inside. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think if there's, there's places to put up the cameras and still capture that gradient from like an urban dense area, lots of, lots of buildings, lots of people all the way out to a more rural or suburban area. Okay. Um, that's, that's the requirement. Okay. So if people are watching from some of those cities, you know, if you're, if you're watching from a city and you're curious if it's big enough to participate, they can send Erica an email, right? Yeah, you can send me an email. You can also check out the Urban Wildlife Information Network um, and I can put that URL in the chat. Yeah, mm -hmm. wonderful. Yeah, there's so many different ways to define a city uh, between impervious surface land cover and population density and yeah, for sure. So it's kind of fun to explore those pieces too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I have I, we have just a little bit of time here, but um, I, uh, I have a couple questions here submitted last week from Facebook and email, and um, I'll, I can try to get through the ones that maybe you haven't answered yet. Um, we have a couple minutes here, if you, if you guys don't mind. No, not at all. Bring it, Sarah. Yeah, let me see. Let me see what we got here. <laughs> um, so last year during the shutdown, there were pictures being shared of wildlife rehabilitating in urban areas around tourist attractions and in major cities. I'm wondering if you see major shifts like that in Oregon's or urban areas. That, I don't know if you guys know the answer to this one. <laughs> no, no, that's a great question. And that's actually part of the formation of that um, research group that's currently happening with the partner cities is to look at what or can we detect any responses um, pre and post shutdown. And I know it was really interesting to see a lot of those. There was a, a chunk of time where there was a lot of news reports about yeah. like, you know, dolphins in the bay and all these wonderful things happening. And there's definitely been, um, kind of, I've, I've seen back and back and forth on whether or not that was really a function of, of uh, less people being out and about or just that we're noticing more uh, because we were all stuck at home. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, it's hard to tease those apart sometimes, but that will be hopefully something uh, for that new publication to definitively say. I know in Portland, we're still, um, we didn't, don't necessarily have a, a strong connection because we were just ramping up our, our program here to really say if in Portland, we're seeing big differences uh, definitively. So I don't have anything to add, Erica, feel free. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think, you know, we are our official UN status. We just hit that this past fall, really. So um, we didn't really qualify for the parameters of the, the COVID paper, but I think anecdotally, like my morning walk with the dog, um, I, I think I may have mentioned this before, but I, a few, maybe a month after the Portland shutdown, we had an enormous flock of pigeons move in to our neighborhood that definitely weren't there <laughs> before. So um <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if like the paper finds some sort of difference in behavior. Um, but yeah, excited to see. Very yeah, cool. shifting food resources for sure. Yeah. Part of what you mentioned about those pigeons, right? Like they didn't yeah. have any resources downtown that they would normally have from people maybe out eating their lunch in the park and some crumbs. Yeah, <laughs> Different they're, now, dynamic. <laughs> they're now here for all the, all the songbird like bird feeders, I think. Smart. <laughs> and the corn for the squirrels. There's a lot of that in my neighborhood, so. 
Um, all right. The next question I have here is actually about being certified. What's the importance of getting backyard habitat certified? I don't know if you know that either. I love this question. <laughs> I'm certified, full disclosure. Um, I'm in Washington County, so it took a while to be like eligible, but I was so excited. Um, I love this program. Um, I, I love that program in large part because it gives you some tools and some information on how you can make your yard more wildlife friendly, right? Like it'll give you guidance on it. I think you can certainly do things on your own, but it really helps put it in perspective and you get coupons for native plants, which is also amazing. <laughs> nice. um, but you, it, I, it's constantly surprising to me to kind of compare and contrast the ways that we maintain our local areas, just, just our, our yards, no matter how big or small they are, can really contribute so much to, especially species that it's easy for them to move in urban environments like birds. That's the first thing that you're gonna notice a change if you start to have more native plants and different types of structure in your environment. Um, if you're lucky to be close to maybe some remnant or green space areas, you can really start to bring in the native wildlife that are already associated with that and expand their usable space, you know, kind of for lack of a better word. And it's such a treat to just watch these things grow and develop. And they're so self-sufficient. It's cheaper. You don't, once they're established, you don't have to water them. They put that, put out their own seeds. You just have to keep the invasives down. That's, that never ends. <laughs> but um, there is great value, I say, in um, having native plant landscaping and trying to enhance that natural space for our local wildlife. So I am a huge fan of that program. <laughs> I'll stop there. I could do yeah. something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I've always been very interested in that program, too. And I think it's so cool when they do, when I walk around even my own neighborhood um, in Portland and I'll see people who have gotten backyard certified. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a pretty cool thing that you can be a part of. Okay, um, yeah, I think we have time for like one more. Um, let's see, find one that you maybe haven't answered yet. Uh, if I think that there's a development going in in my neighborhood that's going to affect wildlife in my area, what should I do? Mm. That's a tough one. Yeah, I, yeah, definitely chime in here, Erica, too, because it's very difficult. Um, once something's already happening on the landscape, that means they've already put in the plans, they've already got it all set, and now they're breaking ground and moving forward. So it's difficult to make it to influence that change when it's already in motion. Um, I think overall, though, one of the, some of the key things that we can do is work with developers before they're starting to develop on things like wildlife friendly design, how do we enhance green space? There's so many other ecosystem benefits and services we get from having habitat spaces, including stormwater management, you know, uh, nutrient cycling. And sorry, I'm going to channel my class now. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but all those things come together in these urban environments. And, and there's also such a so much uh, literature out there on human health benefits of having access to nature. So all these things combine and, and do provide a, an incentive, I think, to developers because generally they can also um, charge a little bit more for their pieces, which has other problems associated with it. But um, <laughs> again, I digress. Um, I think that also the research that's being done in urban environments and con contributions from programs like UN can tell us what features are wildlife friendly. Um, and so all of those things come together to help support that push and that movement to more wildlife friendly design. We're not going to stop new buildings. We're not going to stop infill. These things are going to happen, but how can we do it better? Um, and when there's an opportunity, how can we retrofit to also do it better? Um, backyard habitat's one of those opportunities, right? Um, but then can we do it on a bigger scale with things like development? Um, and there may be some opportunities. You might be able to bend an ear here or there if something's already starting, but it can be really challenging. Um, I would just say that approaching from a collaboration standpoint and trying to work with is easier than working against in a lot of ways, um, but it's challenging no matter what and can be really sad. I've definitely seen plenty of infill happening in my neighborhood and it always breaks my heart a little bit to see those trees come down um, and those areas cleared. But um, again, backyard habitat, improve where we can improve. <laughs> 
I love it. Erica, do you have anything else to add to that? I, I most, I kind of just have a follow-up question. Does Portland have, in Fort Collins, we, before any development happened, whether it's just a home renovation or a large development of some kind, we always had a sign and like a, like you could call in to express your concern um, or ask questions about what was going up. I, I'm not sure if Portland has that though. Um, I don't know all the details about it, yeah. but in a lot of cases, yes, those signs will go up and they're pretty nondescript and pretty small. So you got to keep an eye out for them, but that does give you an opportunity to at least give some input um, again, but uh, then things happen, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. I will also say my sister is an architect in Portland um, oh. and I've, I've gotten some insight into some of the, and this might be different, Leslie, for you, uh, Beaverton, I think codes vary from county to county, but um, there, there are some surprisingly strict codes that go into building a new house in Portland, and a lot of them are quite progressive. You can only take so many trees, and after that many trees, there's a significant amount of money you have to pay to take more trees, um, and I think now in Portland, there's a requirement to to use some of the, the mechanisms Leslie was talking about with uh, bioswales and green roofs and, and doing things in our building. Um, it's, it's, it's not perfect, of course, but it, it was heartening for me to see that through my sister's work. So. Yeah, policy can make a huge difference for sure. And yeah, I, I'm in unincorporated Washington County. So there's a lot of things that squeak by here. <laughs> so, uh, so it's definitely different. But yeah, there are requirements when you add impervious surfaces in Portland to add those infiltration swales, which can also provide habitat. Um, quick kind of connection to red-legged frogs is out in Gresham, there's actually uh, the most urbanized population of red-legged frogs that we know about in the metro region. Great work by Laura Guter on, on that and, and others. Um, and they are actually reproducing in stormwater infiltration ponds that are in neighborhoods. Wow. And as long as there's some connected greenway, they're out there. And so anyway, dual benefit there, right? <laughs> Habitat and infiltration. <laughs> wow. Um, well, that's all we have time for. Unfortunately, if you have any other questions, um, please feel free to share in the chat or you can always submit them to Sarah at myowf.org and I can get those to our presenters. Um, or maybe we can have both of you on for a follow-up if we get a lot, of, um, a lot of people excited about wanting to get involved. That would be something I would love to host too. Cool. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah. Erica, would you like to plug anything or any other projects that you're involved in? I know you might not be with UN PDX for forever, but um, is there anything else going on with UN that you would want to plug right now? Um, <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's totally fine. <laughs> I'll put, so people I'll will contact you if they want to volunteer. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Please. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll put the link in the chat again. <laughs> Just refresh it. Please and, do. Uh, yeah, and Leslie, do you have anything else that you want to share? Anything you want to plug maybe for Samara Group? Well, I think overall, I would say in regards to like the UN program and, and others, if you, if you have a strong interest in urban wildlife, getting that connection to the International Urban Wildlife Conference is a great entry point um, just to learn more about what people are doing. I have such great memories of listening to talks. Um, there was a like urban carnivore talk and I was like, oh, this is interesting. And it was yeah, there was like a coyote talk and a cougar talk. And then there was an alligator talk. And then there was a tiger talk, this man from India. So it's just the context is really amazing. And being able to see all this great work that people are doing. Also just a great group of people that are really passionate about caring for both their wildlife and their communities. So human communities. <laughs> <laughs> so cool. <laughs> Oh, I love that. Well, um, thank you both so much for being here, for sharing your time and sharing your expertise with us. Um, and thank you, Cole, for joining our panel today. Yeah, thank you both for having us. Oh, this, this has been so inspiring, you two. Thank you so much for all the work you're doing. Well, yeah. so you guys. <laughs> yeah, likewise.
And thanks to everybody else who was able to join our discussion here today in the chat. You may have noticed that we'll be releasing community conservation episodes monthly with wide ranging topics. To support the series and public education on conservation, feel free to donate uh, in the form below to the Oregon Wildlife Foundation, or you can visit our website, myowf.org. I'm, I'm going to put that in the chat as well. Um, this discussion is going to be released on our website, and a link is going to be sent to the registered email that you used here today. So you can also subscribe to our newsletter to stay up to date with OWF projects by, again, visiting our website. I'll put it here in the chat. And one last thing I want to mention is the Safe Passage campaign that we have in the form of a new proposed Oregon license plate. Hopefully you've seen it before, <laughs> either here or elsewhere. Um, it's called the Watch for Wildlife license plate and plate sales for this specialty plate will come back to our foundation and not any other state department. So it will specifically go to funding habitat connectivity projects, which obviously we wanna keep learning about and doing as demonstrated by this episode here today. So reserve your plate. Um, they're only available on our website and I'll put the direct link for you to reserve your plate today in the chat. <laughs> And thanks again, and we'll catch you next time.